Council Member Boland. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, could you, Mr. Kelson, speak generally about how the ability to read all meters in the city remotely in a few minutes has translated to savings around CBU? Uh, the obvious one is we, we don't have meter readers driving around all the time um, and um, you know, burning gasoline, driving trucks, um, going door to door. And those, those, and what that means is, is two things. First of all, we're not spending the money on the fuel and the maintenance. We're reducing wear and tear on vehicles. We're re reducing the number of times a truck rolls. But the other thing it's doing for us is there utilities like a lot of things, there's always more to do than, than you can get done. So what, what happens is there are things that either just get, uh, maybe they get left out because of triage or maybe they uh, just get set aside and, and, and we don't get around to them. Well, that sort of thing uh, costs money in the long run and uh, maybe not in the short run, but in the long run, those things are things that you really need to come back and do. So having, uh, having fewer people out reading meters means we can have more people doing other things like we've been painting fire hydrants. Um, you know, painting fire hydrants seems totally aesthetic, but it's not because it prevents rust and it prevents uh, degradation of that. And also it makes the city look like it's paying attention to things when, when, it, when our fire hydrants aren't rusty. Uh, so we've been doing some of those kinds of things. Uh, you know, generally speaking, we can pick up things that we wouldn't have done that might cost us a lot of money down the road. Uh, this is a brief thank question. Um, wait, one, one more, Mr. Sims, thank you. Um, should we expect to see the uh, water main replacement line on uh, in the budget uh, after 2025 be no less than $3 million a year? I mean, like, are you ramping up to that? And it's gonna stay 3 million or more? That's our plan, yes, to ramp it to 3 million. And then uh, presume if we'll review to see if we've achieved the 100 year replacement schedule. And if we have, then that 3 million would grow with inflation. It wouldn't be growing in real terms in the future. And on the, the on, uh, for people who look at uh, the bill rather than the, just the water line or the wastewater line, uh, it may be 21% increase for uh, the water line, but how would, much would you say the average bill will go up as a result of this? About about three dollars for an average customer, a little, between three and four dollars for the average customer. Which is about six percent, ten percent. What roughly? Um, oh, of the total bill. Um, yeah. Total the uh, sewer part of the bill, and Laura knows this better than I do. But the the sewer part of the bill is actually approximately one and a half. Is that, is that right, Laura? Can you join us? Um, the sewer part is like one and a half times as big as your water bill. Is that right? That's Sorry, right. that ballpark. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's more like maybe six percent or six or seven percent for your okay. total bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Council Member Rollo, then Council Member uh, Isabel Piedmont Smith. Mr. Kelson, I stepped out for a minute, so I hope this isn't a redundant question. But in your presentation, you showed that the residential user is using per unit uh, is paying more than industrial commercial or Indiana University. And this tends to even it a bit uh, in terms of the percent rate increase. Um, is there a goal eventually to make them commensurate to, to make it, uh, to even it to in entirely? Uh, yes, actually the, over the two phases of this rate request, uh, we would have the, um, all of the all of the customer classes except residential and irrigation would be at cost of service. Irrigation would still be well below and uh, residential would still be a little bit above. Uh, we didn't want to take the full step uh, for irrigation. First of all, it's 164%. That's just a, a, a huge increase. Um, but, uh, and when you look at who's paying that, it's, uh, it's IU, the city parks, the county parks, and um, and uh, MCCSC are the biggest are the biggest ones. So um, that's just a huge increase. But moreover, the the price you know the the demand is inelastic. So what you, what you do expect is going to happen is that it, is 
it's there it's over there's going to be some elasticity in the in the in the demand so if the price goes up especially if the customers anticipate that in the future it's going to go up again irrigation users are going to have the opportunity to make changes and make improvements to bring that more into line because what happens uh, an awful lot of that difference between the residential price and the irrigation price is the fact that we have to have our system sized especially the plant it has to be sized to handle the irrigation demand that only happens in the summer and and so uh, if we were pricing everything out as mark had pointed out if you're pricing everything out based on the average and leaving out those peaks uh, you're 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 subsidizing the peak by mm. um, by everyone else. So the idea is that um, over time, if if uh, increases in the in the uh, um, in the irrigation rate may lead to less consumption for on the irrigation side, which would smooth out that the, the peak in the summertime, reducing the size of that peak will tend to change the distribution in the cost of service analysis. So uh, we don't want to overshoot on, on that rate change uh, because what, what may happen is if you raise it the full amount and then everybody starts conserving like crazy, well, then we may come back two years from now or three years from now and discover that we're now undercharging residential because we're overcharging irrigation in comparative terms. I see. Um, Mr. President, I have one other question. Shall I wait? Um. Please go ahead. Councilmember Piedmont Smith is next. Okay, uh, then I'll ask. Uh, so, Mr. Kelson, um, government, uh, county, and city government use about 22% of the electricity in our community, and that translates to greenhouse gas emissions. And as I recall, the utilities department uses the lion's share of electricity just by out of necessity. Um, are we reducing energy use, electricity use commensurate with our stated goals? And could you maybe address uh, how things are going in terms of utilizing the uh, waste, the waste treatment plants in terms of uh, anaerobic digester and whether that's feasible, whether that's continuing uh, the work on that? So there's a, a few things, a few answers to that. Uh, the first one is uh, we do uh, take steps to, to uh, to do, we've done a lot of lighting improvements in the first place. So that's that's taken a bite. We've also uh, installed solar at several, several of our facilities. Uh, at the water plant, uh, there's not as big an area for the array and we have to pump the water up a big hill and then all the way to town. So it's it's we've taken a bite, but not a huge bite in electrical demand at Monroe. Uh, at the wastewater plants at, at Dillman, we have taken a sizable bite uh, by by uh, the solar panels at the plant. The other thing that's happening there is we're in the middle of a huge uh, renovation project uh, that's going to modernize that plant, uh, modernize the controls for aeration, uh, which will keep us from using more electricity than we need to. Uh, right now, we don't have closed loop control for aeration. So what happens is we tend to, over, uh, tend to use more oxygen than you absolutely have to. So with, uh, with improved controls and with improved um, blowers, we're going to be able to cut that down. And we think it's gonna be in round numbers, maybe 10 or 15% reduction in the energy use for, for aeration at the Dillman plant. Um, of course, we still have pumps, uh, but aeration is the biggest consumer at Dillman and it is the largest uh, consumer in, in the county. So plant renovations, uh, efficiency improvements in our equipment, uh, and you know, ultimately, if we can get to the point where uh, that, if that summer peak or the day-to-day -day or the week-to-week -week peak can be, uh, can be smoothed out a little bit, uh, we can also take some steps to, uh, uh, to smooth out the, 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 distribute, the delivery of water from the plant to the, to the city. So there's, uh, as, we go, as we go forward, we're, we can continue to make uh, efficiency improvements throughout the system. Now, as for anaerobic digestion, which is, um, I apologize, uh, it's is really kind of a wastewater, uh, a wastewater topic, but it's a, it's an interesting one. Um, at Dillman, it's it's proven to not be uh, cost effective, and the debt service for it would be just enormous. But we are working with uh, with the uh, ESD, uh, Alex Crowley, and his 
his team to look at an alternative that would be focused on uh, food waste, other uh, by, by, uh, compostable organic wastes uh, streams and uh, uh, wastewater waste from the, uh, the sludge from the Blucher pool plant uh, and possibility of doing land application in the long term. So we are looking into a smaller scale anaerobic process there and leaving the Dillman anaerobic process for uh, perhaps one day when we have to expand that plant again to from 20 to 25 MGD. At that point, we'd have to do major plumbing changes at the plant uh, to achieve it. And that seems to be the natural time. Thank you for that very thorough answer. Great, thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I had a question about the uh, monthly surcharges for fire protection service in the different customer classes. Can you explain um, what that uh, cost covers? And then in particular, I'm interested in um, why the amount for IU seems to be decreased uh, with this ordinance. It basically pays for the fire hydrants. I, in, in short, just the shortest answer is that it, it pays for fire hydrants and the service of the fire hydrants. IU uh, is different from any of our other customers. Uh, not only they're our largest customer, but we sell water to them at a number of master meters. And then most of their fire hydrants are actually maintained by them. So uh, we, we charge them for the, meat, for the fire hydrants that we provide, but we don't put, charge them for the fire hydrants that they provide. So uh, why is this um, charge being decreased in the ordinance before us tonight? Mark can take that one. A lot of it has to do and um, with the way the study was completed last time, there's what's called demand factors uh, that are used in the calculation based on the size of the meters. And um, when we calculated the demand factor, I don't know if it's so much that the overall cost went down, as much as it is on some of them, the demand factors that were originally used in the study like 25 years ago uh, may not have been in, the same as we're using today. So there was some shifting around of that cost. So uh, would you say that the, the proposed cost of um, 1,731 uh, for the IU master meter is, is closer to the actual cost to the, to the utility? Correct, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. There, there are some factors that have changed. I mean, AWWA changed your standards on some and that could be part of what occurred also. Um, All right, thanks. That, okay, thank you. Um, before we go to public comment, do we have any other second round um, questions from council colleagues? Okay, seeing none, um, Ms. Lacey, um, how many do we see for public comment? Um, Let's see, I, I presently see two. Okay, um, thank you. Um, can we start with Ms. Washburn? We can, and I'm gonna ask Mr. Lucas to share his screen. And I believe that Ms. Washburn should be able to unmute herself now. Hi, Ms. Washburn, thank you for your patience. Hi. You, you'll have five minutes or so. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lucas? Okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Sandy Washburn. Thank you for your service and your time today. And uh, Mr. Kelson, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. And let me just start by saying, I, I didn't realize from the notice that was sent in the mail, the compartmentalization, water service, sewer, um, storm. And I came in 2018 to talk about the storm sewer rate. And I, my presentation is kind of about that today. So I'm at 613. It's the lowest point in Prospect Hill. 
the picture on your left is in front of my house, right, the alley to the right. And then uh, you see the back of my house on the right. Next slide. Uh, these are storm sewer drains that are at the corner of Fairview and Fourth. There are three all together, and I've shown you pictures of two of them. Uh, yes, there are storm drains underneath those water, the water and debris. It's always like this. Next slide. So you can see I've cleaned out the southwest corner, and there's still a lot of mud. I haven't gotten it all. And you know, there's a lot of debris. I do this a lot. I've been out of town for four days. I went down there today, completely covered up. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is Maple, which is a block and a half down. And uh, there are two storm drains. Uh, you can't really see them, but they're right at the corner here. And the street debris causes the water to completely bypass the drain on the southwest corner and almost completely bypass the southeast corner drain. You can see the water running down the, the, the center of the street. And this happens all the time. Uh, next slide. There are no storm drains on West Third to East or west of Maple. And sorry, uh, Mr. Lucas, I didn't realize that I thought you had the updated presentation. So I asked Phil Peden to pull a map of storm sewers in Prospect Hill. And from our house at 4th, all the way up to the crest of the hill, which is just past Prospect, and all the way to the cemetery, no storm sewers, zero. So all this water comes down to 4th Street. And when they put the curbs on in the neighborhood, um, it just all channels down 3rd Street and then on to 4th Street. Next slide. So, um, you know, at the vote for the last increase, Mr. Kelson assured me that more employees would be hired and the storm drains would be cleaned more often. And I've seen absolutely no evidence of this. I do see ads in the paper for volunteers to adopt a drain. And I just wanna say these storm sewer drains are too important to leave to volunteerism. They take on all the water of Prospect Hill. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to hear about the smart meters and the extra staff. And I really hope this means that the storm drains will get cleaned off. I also really think the streets need to be cleaned better. When I lived in Ann Arbor, you know, one day a month, we couldn't park on the street and they clean the streets. So thank you for your time today. Um, I, I wanted to say I'm really against the water rate increase, and I really didn't realize that was for water service, but I feel like we had a, a storm water increase in 2018, and I certainly have not appreciated any part of that. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Washburn. Um, who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have... Keith Thompson, and I believe um, they're unable to, they're able to unmute now. Mr. Thompson, are you ready? Yes. Hi, right, you have about five minutes, thank you. Yeah, again, my name is Keith Thompson and I do work for Indiana University. I serve the university, I'm the assistant vice president for facility operations and energy, energy management utilities. And I serve all seven campuses throughout the state. I do wanna thank you for allowing me to speak today, President Sims and council. Um, and we, we at Indiana University, we appreciate all the hard work that uh, CVU has put in to putting this capital plan together. I've actually spoken at several of the CVU meetings expressing IU's concerns about this rate increase to the university. Um, I, Indiana, underst Indiana University understands that we're looking at a 40% rate increase, which is significant to the largest customer for CBU. And we understand that'll come in two phases if approved before the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission. 
you know, in, in general, IU is in favor of infrastructure improvements. Um, our president, IU president, Michael McRobbie and the board of trustees have stood behind infrastructure improvements on the university campus for the last, for the past decade. So we understand what, what is involved to get uh, infrastructures improved. Um, IU's water infrastructure um, is only as good as CBU's water infrastructure. That is, we, we, we buy all our water from CBU. And so we need to make sure that both of the infrastructures are in good working order to be successful. And we support water rate increases that are prudent for infrastructure improvements. However, IU strongly objects to the large rate increase and the assumption that Indiana University is not currently paying our fair share of CVU uh, water infrastructure costs. We have reviewed the consultants reports and we don't feel the analysis that was perform performed therein and the proposed rate, and rate structure takes into account I use a substantial $15 million plus of water infrastructure improvements on our campus. We just don't feel like our infrastructure is being credited um, back to the service to Indiana University. And we think that uh, warrants further investigation. You know, as, as a partner with the city, um, Indiana University has made numerous improvements to city streets and our, during our infrastructure projects and IU's efforts have not been accounted for in the proposed cost of service analysis that are provided here this evening. Um, we have, Indiana University has made numerous capital investments in our water infrastructure over the years, but we do not want to continue to make these water system improvements and also pay a high CBU water infrastructure, much higher rates. We, we can't do both. We can't make these investments on our campus and pay a 40% rate increase. Um, we have, we have offered to work more closely with CBU, but we haven't recently seen any, any proposed solutions. You know, we've offered to share our resources with CBU. And, you know, we had a, a great discussion this evening about, you know, the AMI system, the advanced metering infrastructure. We offered, Indiana University also has a smart system. We have census, uh, radio towers on top of Ballantyne and Igaman. We offered to share that infrastructure with CBU, but CBU wanted, wanted to uh, build their own infrastructure so they could read their own meters. But we have the same system. We've had that system for years. And we're, we're just looking for creative ways to keep the costs down for everybody in the city of Bloomington. So we are looking for other creative ways that we could work with CBU to, to keep the rates down for all customers. Um, Indiana University, we understand things cost money, but a 40% rate increase, we cannot immediately pass those increased costs onto our students. Um, we truly hope to, to start a dialogue with the city to possibly find solutions to keep, you know, these costs down and, and, and reasonable for all customers. But at a 40% rate increase level, IU intends to intervene at the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, and we likely will hire technical experts to evaluate you know, the revenue requirements of CBU, their capital improvement plan and the timing thereof, and the cost of service study, and specifically the allocation factors used in that cost of service study. We, 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 will, we will go before the IURC and, and attempt to uh, look, at, look at all of those individual reports and see how they impact Indiana University. Um, we believe Indiana University believes that the water rate case should be equitable to all rate payers in Bloomington. And we do not believe a substantial rate increase to IU is equitable as currently proposed in ordinance 21-09. Mr. Thompson, um, you've gone over five minutes. Are you about to finish up? I have one last thing for President. Thank you, thank you. I wanted to thank you, sir, for allowing me to speak this evening. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Um, Ms. Lacey, do we have any other? I believe that Mr. Lucas has a comment that was forwarded to him. 
Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a comment from Dave Askins with the B Square Beacon. Uh, Mr. Askins says the B Clear Water Main Break data set used to have a bunch of columns like temperature, time of day, pipe material, estimated amount of water loss, and kind of break. It was one of my favorite data sets in all of B Clear. Now, starting today, it looks like there's not really a data set. There's just a bar chart showing the number of breaks per month and a map showing the locations of breaks. The chart and map are great, but I really miss all the other data. I miss the ability to visualize all that data in the way I want. I hope that there are plans to improve the city's stormwater infrastructure to handle all of my bitter tears of disappointment over this. But more seriously, I'm hoping this can be one of those both and type situations, raw data plus bar charts and maps. Thanks. And that is the comment. Thank you very much. Um, do we have anyone else on the horizon, Ms. Lacey? I do not see any other hands raised and I do not have any messages. Okay, thank you. Seeing none, we'll return to council for final comments. Do we have any? Council member Rollo. Mr. President, could we follow up with a couple of questions before we go to comments? Uh, I think you can. I don't know if there's any. Do we have any any other council members that have questions? <sighs> Proceed, Council Member Rollo. Well, we had uh, two uh, interesting public comments that uh, I'd like to give uh, Director Kelson a chance to address. Um, maybe maybe we could begin with Mr. Thompson's uh, objection to the rate structure and. Uh, hear Mr. Kelson's uh, response to that. Well, my, my response to that is that uh, the uh, industry standard methodologies were used. Uh, the allocation factors have been published. Um, uh, it's uh, certainly it's possible that another contractor would come up with a different uh, set of allocation factors that certainly could occur. Um, the thing about uh, about accounting for infrastructure costs, uh, we we don't we sell water to the meter. We don't sell water to the buildings at any of our customers' facilities. So the anything it's just like a customer's the service line from the meter to your house. That's yours. That's not ours. Uh, we sell water to your meter. Um, not to your house. And that goes for large infrastructure and large facilities, just like it does for small ones. Uh, but that said, uh, the, uh, we've, we've had a good working relationship uh, with the folks at IU. And uh, uh, I'm certain that if that uh, uh, over, over the next few months that uh, as we're going through the IURC process, uh, if uh, certainly if, if if the university brings uh, some uh, specific questions or some specific concerns to light uh, regarding specific allocation factors, we can certainly review how, they, how that impact will happen. And I'm certain that the commission will do that as well. So uh, that it is part of the process. And I, I certainly wouldn't uh, criticize anyone at any, any, at any of our large customers for, uh, for uh, wanting to, to uh, have their own, you know, their own separate opinion or a second opinion, and then uh, uh, regarding the way the allocations were done. Uh, but uh, uh, to our ability to to understand them, uh, the assumptions make sense. But uh, I think that this is all part of the process of doing a cost of service analysis. Uh, it's part of the reason that Bloomington hasn't done a cost of service rate making process in a quarter of a century. Uh, because these 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 things are difficult and challenging, uh, but certainly we'll work with anybody who 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 has any specific uh, specific uh, identi identified concerns. Thank you. I'm sorry. Was it moved? Any other questions, Councilman Rollo? Okay. Well, see. if if well, if see. Mr. Kels. Uh, if Mr. Kelson wants to address the stormwater clearing, uh, stormwater perhaps now is an appropriate time since that's uh, well, the topic. I think, well, 
the, the we're drains. Talking and about, the... We're talking about the water, I think. Uh, go ahead, Councilman Rollo. Well, I, I, you're right. It's tangential, but there was there was a uh, stormwater rate increase, and uh, a customer asks about uh, the uh, infrastructure and the uh, and the personnel that was uh, going to be applied. And so, I wanted to give Mr. Kelson a chance to address that, since we're considering another rate increase, although not stormwater in this case. But, uh, Mr. Kelson, do you? Well, uh, we did just what we said. Uh, we established a green infrastructure crew. Uh, one of the things they do is assist with uh, inlet cleanouts. Uh, we have thousands of inlets uh, in the city. Uh, one of the challenges um, uh, at Ms. Was Washburn's property is that years, if you look at the old maps, that was once a pond. So it's, as she says in, the, in her presentation, it's the low spot in Prospect Hill. So it's, it's going to be a challenge to keep, to keep it dry. Now, uh, we don't do street sweeping at CBU. That's, that's, not, um, that's, that's done uh, by, by public works. And I'm not pawning off the concern on them. I think it's something that uh, CBU can work together with public works to see about uh, improving the, the, the street cleaning uh, in a number of places. We do have this problem uh, in lots of places uh, in the city where you know, we're Tree City USA, which means we're Leaf City USA, and uh, we're gonna always have a, a challenge with this. So, uh, but we will redouble our efforts. I did have a crew out um, in uh, Ms. Washburn's neighborhood last week. Uh, at the time they were there, the inlets were clean, but I don't, uh, I don't know who, uh, who had cleaned them or, or, or whatnot, but uh, certainly, we can review the stormwater infrastructure there, as uh, as she said, pointing it out that uh, she'd spoken with Phil Pete, and, and he's the one I would speak to about this. So I will definitely follow up with Ms. Washburn when, when uh, in the in the coming weeks. Thank you, thank you, Councilmember Volan. Uh, Council Borrello asked the questions I wanted to ask. I guess I would uh, just say. Um, uh, does it bother you that we don't have um, uh, more regular street sweeping where people have to move their cars and the like? Well, I, as on behalf of our MS4 program, I would certainly love to have more street sweeping. Um, it's, but it's, a, it's an expensive operation of course, uh, to do that and uh, re requires a lot of equipment. But yes, anything that keeps the streets cleaner uh, will keep stormwater infrastructure cleaner. And uh, reduce one of the other problems with being at the bottom of of a watershed is that uh, you get all the all the in addition to the leaves you get other debris that actually gets down into the drain and eventually the and eventually it can clog up and, and reduce the effectiveness of it so uh, but we'll de we'll definitely get over and, and take a look um, and we do look for solutions uh, when when we get uh, when we get complaints and we do uh, we, we will look things over again uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Oh, I didn't have anything. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I had a hand up. Yeah. Sorry, Council Member Flaherty. Uh, my questions have been asked as well, thank you. I love it when a plan comes together. Okay, do we have any other uh, questions? Okay, we will now go to final comments. Um, do we have any final comments from any of our council colleagues? Council Member Flaherty. Um, yes, I guess just first as a preliminary matter, I'll note that um, I'm gonna support this ordinance and would be happy to vote on it tonight. Um, I know we didn't have a previous committee hearing, so um, you know, if there were a lot of questions open, I don't think it was without question that we could postpone to another meeting, but I'd be ready to vote tonight and consider the question. Um, I appreciate all the work that, that City of Bloomington Utility staff has put in over the, the last many years, um, really bringing us up to speed on a number of fronts, getting us on a schedule to uh, be able to replace pipe on a sustainable uh, time scale. That's really important. Um, and also the efforts to uh, move us to a more equitable rate structure in particular as it relates to cross subsidies from residents to other users. Um, I, I uh, my hunch, I appreciate Mr. Thompson uh, speaking to his comments too and, and um, 
respect their ability to to uh, go before IURC to to share their their concerns as well. Uh, but my my impression and what Mr. Kelson shared as well is that investments made by anyone uh, beyond the meter are not something that that CBU should be in the in the business of crediting or or using as a as a metric to reduce uh, someone's rates. Just like I live in a condo building, uh, if we had to improve uh, some sort of infrastructure beyond the meter in our units, um, we wouldn't get credit for that either. So of course I use a much bigger scale, but um, I think that the same reasoning applies. So I appreciate uh, the conversation around that. And uh, that's all for me, thanks. Thank you. Any further, Council Member Scambellari? Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Kelson, to, to you and your staff, thank you. It was a very thorough report. Um, and you made it accessible, and I'm grateful for that because I have a sense of how much specialized knowledge goes into what you do. Um, I really have been concerned about our water infrastructure lately. Um, water mains are, and the water main breaks we've had, I think underscore that. Um, I, I am glad we have the goal of having a hundred year replacement cycle. My hope is we can get that number even lower at some point. Um, I also appreciate greatly the move toward cost of service pricing. Um, I've discussed this increase in a constituent meeting. Uh, it's been on my website. It's uh, been in the monthly newsletter that I do. And I think most, I've maybe gotten a dozen comments. I think two of those were, oh gosh, another rate increase. Please not now, we're in a pandemic. All the rest were, well, yeah, everything else has gone up in price in the last five years, I guess water gets more expensive too. Um, and residents were very understanding about that. So um, again, thank you for the good work you've done in laying out this case uh, and I'll be supporting this. Thanks. Thank you. Any further final comments from council members? Council member Rollo. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelson, really thorough presentation. And I, I appreciate all the outreach that you've done uh, in, in the days before this as well. It seems to me that IU has been benefiting from uh, a rate structure in the past that has uh, transferred uh, costs per unit mostly to residents. And so evening that in for equity seems to be uh, obviously paying more for IU at this point, but they benefited in the past. And this is a better situation for residences. Uh, I appreciate your efforts on conservation and the capital improvements. Uh, I, I too think that the cost of service pricing is uh, a very good idea and I appreciate you implementing it and continuing that. And uh, I also appreciate your efforts to keep these rate increases occurring at a regular uh, pace um, because I think that it, otherwise it becomes a very unstable situation um, in terms of revenue and it also uh, you know, applies eventually a large sticker shock. So um, this makes much more sense to, to proceed in, in this process. So uh, thank you very much. I'll be supporting it. Thank you. F Council Member Volan. Uh, I wanna echo what my colleagues have said. They've all made excellent points. Uh, the only thing I'd, I would add is um, that I think I'm, I'm a little chagrined that I haven't thought about street sweeping uh, very much and that I think maybe it's time that the city thought about doing a little bit more um, uh, because we don't in fact require people to move their cars uh, in neighborhoods once a month to uh, clean the streets. At least I don't recall that seeing that program ever. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think it's something that uh, we need to think about. I don't know how to do it, but uh, it's on my radar now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, seeing no more final comments, I will say this. I am very happy. Um, as you all know, I <clears throat> am the council's liaison to the utility service board. Um, and before that, I sat on the utility service board, as did some of my colleagues. So seeing uh, the, the plannings that have gone on over I don't know, Vic, I was even there before you got there. Um, but seeing how all that has evolved over the years um, is, is important to me and I think to our community. Um, I will also say thank you again for the cost of study service. And for one other, for one reason or another, 
part of what we're doing and part of what this is all about is playing catch up um, with our infrastructure. Um, we're, we're catching up for whatever reason, <laughs> I won't get into it. But I think we're, we have a good plan to get caught up where we can. It'll take a little while, but I am encouraged with that plan. So seeing no further comments from our council members, um, are we ready for the question? Okay, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, council member Scambolori? Yes. Council Member Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. In Mount Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Volan? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that was adopted nine zero. We do have more legislation this evening. Um, Mr. Parliamentarian. Yes, President Sims, I move that uh, Ordinance 2110 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Sims. Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Volan? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Ms. Gambleri? Yes. I think we. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Seems like I'm hearing things a little bit, I'm sorry. Okay, it's been moved and seconded um, that ordinance 21-10 be introduced or read by the, by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Will the clerk please read? Yes, ordinance 2010, an ordinance authorizing the acquisition, construction, and installation by the city of Bloomington, Indiana of certain extensions and improvements to the city's waterworks utility the issuance and sale of revenue bonds to provide funds for the payment of the cost thereof and the collection, segregation, and distribution of the revenues of such waterworks, utility, and other related matters. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance authorizes the City of Bloomington to issue one or more series of its waterworks revenue bonds of 2022 in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $17,200,000. The 2022 bonds will be issued to finance the costs of design, engineering, acquisition, con construction, equipping, and improvement of capital projects related to the Monroe Water Treatment Plant and distribution system of the waterworks utility and pay costs of issuance of the bonds. There is no committee recommendation. Mr. President. I'm sorry, I muted. Council Member Flaherty, sorry uh, about that. You're okay. I move ordinance 2110 be adopted. Second. Okay, um, thank you. And we have present again for this, Mr. Kelson. Uh, I'm assuming you have Mr. Crone with you as well. And will he be presenting? I yes, I, I have okay. uh, uh, with us, we have Jennifer Wilson from Crow. Uh, and Buzz Crone from Crone Associates, and they can tell you the details of the bond proposal. As I mentioned in the presentation, uh, the larger presentation, uh, the, these bonds will support uh, the capital investment plan uh, in 2022 through 2024. So I'll leave it to I'll leave it to Jennifer and Buzz. Thank you. Please present. Jennifer, ladies first, if you'd like to go first. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Buzz. Um, yes, yeah, so this bond ordinance supports uh, what we had put into the, the right study of funding some of the projects that uh, Vic has discussed. And so uh, this just sets out the, the parameters of how that bond sale will occur once the IURC will 
um, we'll be bringing it, it in, in accordance with our rate case. Um, so in order to do that, the bond ordinance needs to be passed now and be presented within the rate case. I see to you, Buzz, if you have anything else to add. I would just add, I think I'll, I'll try to echo some of Vic's comments earlier that this is all part of the process. Uh, we're in authorizing the enabling ordinance for this bond issue because uh, the pending IURC case, uh, obviously uh, lots of things, there's lots of uh, water under the dam here yet to be had with respect to uh, the upcoming uh, uh, issues that the commission will ultimately decide. And uh, after the uh, rates are approved, there may be some right sizing potentially, I suppose, on the scope of the projects. But uh, uh, currently, they're anticipating about a $15.8 million project, total project cost. We've got a parameter that's uh, about uh, you know, about 1.4 million greater than that. So if uh, we do have, uh, you know, bids come in high, this or that, there is some wiggle room there. And there's, uh, we've got good solid bond coverage projections in the rate study. Uh, and the way the phase in occurs, it appears that, you know, the, the bond payment would be uh, really just covering probably the interest during construction for the first phase. And then when, uh, when the full phase, phase two hits would be when the full bond payments would kick in and that uh, uh, replacement allowance goes up about a million dollars, I think in phase two as well. So, uh, but that also keeps the coverage ratio strong both during the construction period and uh, after the project's completed. So we feel that there's adequate wiggle room in the, uh, sizing parameters and uh, we just need to part of the process is getting through the commission and uh, uh, that's always an exciting time <laughs> okay thank you do we have any more comments from miss wilson mr kelson or miss mr crone i have okay. nothing to add Okay, thank you. Seeing none, we'll go to our council members for um, questions. Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the public for any public comments. Um, I will remind everyone that, or I'm sorry, our public, that you can indicate you would like to public speak by using a raised hand function in Zoom, or you can send us a message in chat um, I will further remind you that if there's more than one person on the device that you're using, um, please let us know that so we can um, acknowledge everyone and um, ensure that they can comment. Um, Ms. Lacey, do you see anyone? There, there are no hands raised and I don't have any messages in chat. Okay, give it just a second. Okay. Seeing none, we'll go back to council for um, any other questions or final comments that they may have. Okay, going good. Um, I do have one comment. I think uh, in this particular um, ordinance 2110, um, we were able to see this, I think, in, in part of the work session and, and and some other information and what was in our packets. So I think the thoroughness of that presentation, that information is uh, another one of the reasons why this portion is going so smoothly and there's not um, a lot of questions because many of them were answered so thoroughly in the past. So I want to thank uh, Mr. Kelson and his staff and uh, the consulting team uh, for doing that. So um, before we move forward, any Final comments from council colleagues at all. Okay, seeing none. Um, are we ready for the question? Will the clerk please call the roll? I 
they can hear me. Council Member Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Volan? Okay, we seem to have lost Council Member Volan. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. Sims? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> okay, and Ordinance 21 dash 10 is adopted 8 0. Okay, moving um, down the agenda. Thank you so much. You, thank you all. Uh, we do have one more piece of legislation for second reading. Mr. Parliamentarian. So Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 2108 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's been properly moved and second. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Smith. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo. Yes. Volan. Rosenbarger. Yes. Scambolari. Yes. Sims. Yes. <clears throat> And Flaherty. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, it has been moved and second, and that was a, our pass 8 0 uh, to be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Um, will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2108 to amend the city of Bloomington zoning maps by rezoning 87 acres from planned unit development to mixed use corridor regarding 3100 West Fullerton Pike, Bill C. Brown revocable trust petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2108 would rezone 87 acres from planned unit development to mixed use corridor. The land use committee recommendation was due pass 031. Member Flaherty. Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 2108 be adopted. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Um, and before we move forward, I will make note that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Council staff, that there was no recommendation from the Plan Commission on this ordinance. That is, that is correct. correct. That is correct. And I would also further ask the Land Use Committee Chair if uh, they wish to give a report this evening. Yes, sure. Um, is that is that proper? I'm sorry. It looks like I got you by surprise. I don't intend to. No, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the Land Use Committee met last Wednesday, uh, March 10th, uh, for three hours, and um, about 75 minutes of that was spent on this particular ordinance, which is a rezone request for a parcel of land on uh, Fullerton Pike. And um, the request is to rezone from a planned unit development to a uh, mixed use corridor. Um, and we uh, heard from Eric Gerlich, which who I'm sure we'll hear from um, here in a minute as well. Um, uh, and he talked about the comprehensive plan uh, calling for employment use on this parcel. And the, therefore uh, the staff would recommend um, an employment zone rather than the mixed use corridor. And after uh, discussion, we, um, the, the committee members, uh, most um, the committee members felt that uh, there was not, um, uh, a substantial reason to override what our comprehensive plan um, has dictated for this area, which is an employment use. And so the vote was um, 
zero, three, one, one abstention, three against, to um, send this back to the council. Or that was our vote on the project. Okay. And we sent it back to the council with that vote. So with a negative vote. Uh, I think that's all I have. Um, if do any committee members want to add anything? Nope, oh, seeing none. Thank you. That was with a negative due pass recommendation. Okay, um, Mr. Grulick, um, are you present and ready to present? Uh, yes, I am ready. Um, hopefully, everybody can see my screen. Yes. Great. Uh, so, so as mentioned, this is a request um, from Bill C. Brown Revocable Trust uh, for a property at 3100 West Fullerton Pike. Uh, this property is on the very southern, uh, very southwestern portion of the city, the very south limits. Uh, and it's approximately 87 acres in size and it's zoned as a planned unit development. Uh, this property was initially rezoned uh, to the planned unit development in the late 1980s uh, for primary, primarily industrial uses, um, some manufacturing uses. Um, there have been various uh, approvals done over the years. Uh, some residential approvals were carried out in the late 1990s, uh, as well as an approval for a golf course. Um, however, no activity has earlier. occurred on this site. They were talking it still sits undeveloped. Um, so the petitioner is requesting to rezone this um, from the planned unit development designation to the mixed use corridor designation uh, in order to allow for some better marketability and reuse of this property. Um, so as I mentioned, the PUD was approved with mostly industrial uses. Um, so this is the use list from that PUD. Um, you can see various offices, uh, warehousing, some manufacturing uses, some industrial kind of uses. Um, so this property was actually slated for one of the PUDs to be removed as part of the citywide rezoning efforts. And the staff had proposed to rezone this to the mixed use employment district, um, kind of as a result of the use list that you see on the screen that was approved with the PUD. And also because of the comprehensive plan designation for this site as employment center. Um, so the petitioner is proposing to rezone this to the mixed use corridor district. Um, so in the packet, as well as on the slide here, it's kind of a side by side comparison between the mixed use corridor district and the mixed use employment district. Um, the petitioner has proposed to exclude uh, 10 or so uses from the mixed use corridor district. Uh, that would certainly be low em uh, employment gener generating uses. Um, so again, this is kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of the uses that are allowed in the MC um, that would be allowed if this petition were approved. Um, the land uses here that are in bold and with the asterisk are the ones that the petitioner is proposing to remove. Um, so the remaining ones would all be uses that would be allowed uh, if this petition was approved. Um, so one of the concerns that the staff and the plan commission has had um, regarding this petition and specifically the list of uses for the mixed use corridor district um, is not just that uh, the designation from the comprehensive plan encourages this as employment, um, but that by allowing this to have the wider list of uses that you find in the MC zoning district, uh, it really takes away from the possibility that this could be generating uh, employment uses on the site. Um, so this is kind of a current aerial of the property. Um, in 2015, there was an approval that was done in order to allow for some of the soil from this site to be sold to NDOT um, for use as the I-69 project. Um, at that time, we evaluated what would be required to be preserved and saved on the site for tree canopy, uh, riparian buffer, and karst features. So that was all set aside. Um, so you can see the areas that were cleared out. So then it basically resembles the developable portion of this site. Uh, here's just kind of a close up view of that. Um, so it's, it's about 50% of the site uh, that was set aside in preservation uh, and about, about half of that that is developable. Um, so the comprehensive plan, as you can see here, 
Uh, this side is at the lower portion of the screen, the south end of the side, south end of the city. Uh, the light blue designates the uh, employment center areas. So there aren't many areas of the city that are set aside for employment center uh, or that designation within the comprehensive plan. Um, you've got some areas along Fountain Drive along the northwest side. Uh, you've got the areas within the Landmark Business Center, um, areas within the Thompson PUD, uh, and then the areas along the southwest side of town where you've got Southern Indiana Medical Park, uh, Hoosier Energy, um, and then the area to the south of Tap Road that includes Southern Indiana Physicians, um, and then this particular site. Um, so this is certainly noteworthy uh, in its location. Uh, in that it is directly adjacent to I-69 and that there was a specific exit that was installed on Fullerton Pike um, for this site, uh, as well as for Fullerton Pike connection with I-69. Um, so this provides a very unique opportunity for ease of access, um, mostly from uh, I-69 obviously and surrounding areas, um, residents within Bloomington, as well as the overall region itself. Um, so one of the things, there are many things about this petition that uh, certainly need to be evaluated. Uh, the most important of those is the comprehensive plan designation, uh, as well as some of the key notes that the comprehensive plan has for the employment center. Um, you know, with the employment center district uh, designation, certainly the comprehensive plan says that the focus should be on corporate headquarters, major employers, and light high-tech manufacturing uses. Uh, that this district uh, may produce uh, the greatest amount of large traffic, tra truck traffic uh, in comparison to other uses uh, and will require access along uh, the roadway network. You know, as I mentioned, the location on I-69 and the designated exit for Fullerton certainly provides that ease of access. Um, so that, that's an important aspect to note, um, as well as comprehensive plan notes that employment centers uh, by their very nature uh, and the land uses within them can certainly generate a lot of noise and vibration uh, and other impacts. And so it's important to locate these on large acres, which is very large in size. Uh, there are interstate to the west. Um, so with that, um, you know, the comprehensive plan designates this as employment center. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, the staff is proposing to rezone this to the mixed use employment district in keeping with the comprehensive plan designation. Um, so when the plan commission heard this case, uh, there was certainly a mix of uh, opinions on the site. Uh, there were a lot of plan commission members that did feel some sympathy uh, to trying to increase the usability of the site since it sat empty for uh, 30 years or so. Uh, however, there were also a large contingency that really felt like it was important to keep and maintain the designation and encouragement of the comprehensive plan to have this as employment. Um, and so the plan commission voted six to two uh, to one to forward this to the common council with no recommendation. Um, so with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Grulich. Um, I think I, do we have any comments from the petitioner as well? Mr. Sims, this is Mike Carmen. Yes, I, I was asking Mr. Grulick if the petitioner had anything to say, and I see your hand up, so please proceed. All right, thank you. Uh, Mike Carmen, representing the petitioner. Petitioner is the, the property owner of the Bill Brown Revocable Trust, that'd be Mr. Bill Brown. Uh, most of you should know Bill. He's been a, a long time resident and, and long time successful developer of areas in Bloomington. And uh, you can say that with some pride. Uh, uh, you may not remember that Park 37 was his, Park 48, which I consider one of the real crown jewels of the community. It was, it was his development. Now, he didn't build the Cook plant, but he, he certainly did put the Park 48 uh, project together. You recently heard the Century Village, the last, what we believe will be the last phase of the build out of the Century Village PUD uh, was underway. So he has this project left and certainly, uh, not mean to 
disparage Bill, but he's at a point where he'd like to see this and built out and developed in his, in his lifetime. And I say that because he's been on this ground for 35 years. Uh, this this uh, Fulton Pike PUD is about 35 years old now. And Bill would like to see it done. Uh, he, he'd like to see it done responsibly and he'd like to be the one to make sure that happens. Uh, so you've heard from Eric's comments, you heard it from uh, Council Member uh, Piedmont Smith's comments about concerns for the comp plan. And that's what we, I want to address in, in several comments tonight or specific comments that it, it's been suggested by those comments. And I think in, when you read the staff report that this petition to rezone this to MC, mixed use quarter, is in direct conflict with the comp plan. And I don't think that's correct. I don't think you'll conclude that when, when we get done here this evening either. Uh, it's, is it on, uh, we used to say all fours, all all squared up with it? No, but then I don't know that any petition would be. Uh, comp plan is comprehensive. And as all plans, it, it suffers from the one overarching problem, which is, is extremely aspirational with lots of different objectives, lots of uh, concerns, lots of policies, and is very, very difficult when you have something as broad ranging as the originally the GPP, the growth policies plan, and now the comp plan, to find anything that's going to hit all, all those buttons in one petition. But we think we hit a lot of them, and we think we hit a lot of them that it, it concludes it is within line of what the comp plan envisioned for this property. So I'll be a little more specific on that. If I may uh, do this right, see if I can share screen. Oh, sorry. Thought I had this ready to go. We is sharing screen now. Have I done this right? That you, you can see this on the share screen. No. All right. Let me try one more time. Ten on this share screen. Sorry. There we go. I think we got you now. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So Eric showed you a little bit earlier a list of. Uh, uh, uses permitted in the MC zone and compare them with the list of the uses in the ME zone. So to be clear, the city through the staff's efforts uh, goes to the Planning Commission, I believe it's on March 29th with a, the long list of PUDs. I don't know what that number is, 90 some, I believe, uh, to rezone to various other zones. There's a few of the PUDs in the city jurisdiction that are not part of that, but the overwhelming majority are. The staff's recommendation is for the ME zone um, on the rezone of this PUD. Uh, Mr. Brown, property owner, is asking for MC rather than the ME. So what has happened in the staff reports, the presentation of the Planning Commission, even Land Use Committee last week is to really focus on contrasting the ME use and the, ME and the MC uses uh, that because it would seem inevitable that it's going to be one or the other. Uh, it's certainly possible for the this council to deny the rezone and leave it as a PUD. We're not asking for that, uh, but we are asking for the MC zone for some very specific reasons. Uh, what you have here are the table uses. What this did is take what Eric had done and distilled it down to and formats it just a little bit differently. If you look at it, all the column from the table uses in the UDO, the ME, the mixed use employment, they're all listed here. And then correspondingly, what is allowed in the uh, MC zone on that same line. And what you find, and I'll go down through it just- Excuse me, Mr. President, could we ask the this? department to expand the window so we can yeah, see- Yeah, so let's see if I can do this, get you a better view of this. Does that Thank help? you, I appreciate that. Right. Yes, thank you. So what you see is, this is straight from the table. It just took out all the things that were not common to both. Every one of the ME uses is listed here. On the right-hand column are the uses, whether it's allowed or not in the MC zone. Once you find that everything, we're going to come to one line that's not true, but everything that's allowed in the ME use is also allowed in the MC's classification, with one exception, and, and it's actually on the, the next page. This is two pages of uses. I'll come back. You see it there highlighted in yellow. Sorry, I lost you. No, sorry. Well, that was much smoother at this than what I'm showing at the moment. There we go. You see right there highlighting the yellow manufacturing light. So P and the ME not permitted uses in the MC. 
there's an old cliche and it has had numerous iterations over the years. Some of them so, somewhat disparaging of, of classes of people. So try to keep it more generic, but essentially paraphrased would say that one of the signs of a highly foolish person is to do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different result. It, rezoning this property to ME from the PUD is an act of doing the same thing over and over again because it is no, it's almost no change in 35 years. Go back to the uses that Eric showed you on the on his slide, uh, the, the here again. Uh, the table of uses from that uh, uh, PUD, and you can see commercial retail, not allowed. Commercial trade, very limited. Commercial wholesale, very, very limited. You get down to the manufacturing uses, and what you have here are generally what you're going to find lumped it now under the ME of, of manufacturing light. A few of these were what we might have called in years past heavy, main, heavy industrial, but uh, it's like the machinery tool and die. A few of them, but large, for a large part, these are the manufacturing light that the ME would allow. So what the ME zone is giving that you don't get in the MC zone is a perpetuation of this table of uses. And for 35 years, it has not allowed the property to develop. So we're, are we going to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result? Now we keep hearing that I-69 is, has been a game changer. This, suddenly this property is uniquely positioned and therefore it, keep it as is. No changes, keep it as is. And that is no change. Before there was 69, it was 37. And it, when it was 37, that was the arterial road through the community. It's no different. Now we call it 69, it's a little bit bigger. Maybe it's a little bit more far ranging, but it is simply the remains the arterial highway now through the community. And that was true at this intersection, has been true for 35 years and nothing that has not been sufficient to lure development to this area. So moving on. As you look at the history, back in the day, some of you have been around long enough to remember the, the GPP and how that was brought about and developed with the growth policies plan. So this next couple of pages come from the growth policies plan. In the growth policies plan, it had areas they called critical sub areas. This was one of those that the sub areas defined as from Tap Road down to Fullerton. Uh, and this area, and you can see it, I've highlighted in yellow essentially what would be this subject property, this PUD. The area that's north of that is the Medical Park PUD on the south side of Tap Road that is as developed out as the plan called for, as the comp plan calls for, uh, encouraging medical headquarters and corporate headquarters, and that's. Uh, or medical uses, and that's what you have in that northern part. So we look at Mr. Brown's property, and if, even the back as far as GPP is calling for this. Notice the hash line through there. That's a critical feature. That's the proposed road because that area matches now this, which is the city's master thoroughfare plan that was back at the time of the GPP. I've circled the area, the Tap Road in Fullerton. You can see that same road on there. So we have a piece of property that has, has forever had proposed a major thoroughfare through the property. This was a TIF district. It's a TIF district that has never funded, that has never built the road, has never extended any infrastructure. It's a TIF, has been a TIF in name and that's as far as it's gone. But this again is the growth policies plan. I just want to take a few lines out of here and then we'll move on to the comp plan because this really set the stage for this property even moving on before the comp plan. But, under the paragraph on tent. This site is located north of Fullerton Pike, east of 437, which is now 69, south of Tap Road. So that's the area that we're talking about. Uh, I'm sorry, went too far. Uh, you're down in that paragraph and uh, under the land use policies, up there, maybe better easy to see, about the second line of that first bulleted point, medical and corporate offices, land uses are recommended. And that has been developed at the northern part of the, as a separate PUD, but still within this sub area. Light manufacturing and site serving retail. Go back to the PUD list. There's no site serving retail allowed on that. Go to the ME zone. The site serving retail, if at all, is, is would be lumped into what's called small retail, less than 5,000 square feet. There's virtually no retail component in the ME zone. And that is the a significant issue, which we're going to come to again here in a moment. This land, has, this area has been studied. Duke Energy has a program, uh, I think I've heard it referred to as the uh, Strategic Site Inventory. They do uh, uh, 
intense studies of different potential development areas throughout the state. And in uh, this, uh, this particular study uh, of this property happened in, you can see in 2014, in the state of Indiana, uh, one of the sites they chose in, to do their study that year was the Fulton Pike. And this page comes out of that, uh, that study by Duke. This site for potential development. And as you can imagine, Duke was looking at, at development from industrial type uses and, and, and high employment type uses. You can see the road that uh, from the master thorough plant and the on there, you can see the preservation area that Eric referred that earlier. That's that area has been in protected now and has been re duly recorded several years ago, a karst conservancy area. So that's not just preservation by title, it is by fact with recorded conservancy, uh, uh, karst conservancy easement that covers a very large part of this 87 acres. Out of the 87 acres, we're looking at the vocal area in the 40 acre range or less, not 87. Uh, but look what Duke has even put into their report. Three acres, three acres, three acres, three acres, four acres, four and a half acres, and one large building. That would work out to be a little, looks to be about just a little under 20 acres. Even them in their study, even Duke was not looking at a single or even a couple high ticket, high volume employers coming in and developing this site. Didn't project out that, that was how it was going to develop. And that's the significant issue with the, the multiple uh, Lots because that becomes a subdivision issue, which has significant impact on the ability to ever see this property developed. So this, now we finally get to the comp plan, which you've heard several times. And it, it, it was mentioned that uh, it, about, even in the staff report on the page, last page Eric had hosted on, on his share screen, referred to employment centers. And that's what you find in the comp plan, discussion of employment centers. So you go down here, a couple things. Eric pulled out some quote some, some comments out of, out of this text, and I it would certainly appropriate, but there are some others that I think bear your consideration as well. So this is talking generically about employment centers. And it, uh, in various places, had some interesting uh, quotes. Uh, you know, it goes through and discusses site design and various other features. Uh, you can see, uh, talk about uh, uh, city contributions and, and get developing this, but as we get down to the land use development, and this is under this employment center discussion still, and now we get specific as to this site. Second paragraph, right column, refers to I-69 quarter interchanges. The second paragraph, specific interchanges. Uh, for example, Tap Road and Fulton Pike will take on a more employment center characteristic. Notice it says more employment, didn't say uh, 100 percent is more more like the employment centers uh, will take on a more employment center characteristic with retail acting as an accessory use we again come back to the plans calling for retail uses at this site it's a recognition of, that there is an importance to retail uses paired with employment uses if that's what you call them and i would submit that some of the employment the retail uses are heavy employers they may not be manufacturing jobs but they are they are significant employers look at our employment base in the community and it's uh, retail and commercial uh, carries the, the majority of the load of, of employment base. But even the comp plan recognizes the, the need for and the, the importance of retail acting as an accessory use. And that has been our experience with this property. We have a potential use. It is only in the discussion stage. It's certainly not under contract, not, uh, it's no certainty, but that use, which would be I'll characterize as a regional training center, has made it pretty clear that a, something like a regional training center to come here needs employee employee type amenities and, and uses on site. And the couple of things that have come up in those discussions, one is a hotel being on site. Uh, if this is a regional center, it's gonna be drawing people in from other areas. And once the hotel would be looking for a hotel on site to house those people rather than sit, having to drive them up the road some distant place. But a restaurant has come up as being an essential component of, of that use coming here. And that is, is a major issue. Uh, so if you look at the table of uses that Eric showed for the ME, it lists restaurant, but it also lists restaurant as a P with an asterisk. And why, what's the asterisk mean in the, uh, if we go down here, you can see on the, uh, 
the restaurant use there, the, you can see P permitted uh, and P and, and MC, P permit, P with the asterisk and the ME. When you uh, read the ordinance, the UDO and find the asterisk reference, what it says is the restaurant cannot be more than 2,500 gross square feet of floor space. So what do you get with 2,500 gross square feet of floor space? We did a little sampling and whoops, didn't mean to shrink that on you. That you, you can find restaurants your, yourself around them. So these are some you'll probably you should recognize all these. Cheddar, Te Texas Roadhouse or Charlie's, full service sit down restaurants. Go down to the bottom of the list and for under 2,500 gross square feet, uh, these numbers come from the property tax assessment card on, on the based on dimensions of the, of the building, main one floor only, uh, not a two story. So we get a Jiffy Treat, a White Castle and a Dairy Queen. Even to get to the Hardee's, we exceed the 2,500 square feet. We don't get a sit down restaurant, a full service restaurant that would, would serve the students, the trainees at that center until at all. We don't get it in the ME zone. It does, it's not allowed. And this is not something that can be approved on a, on a variance. Uh, it's the definition of the use that would require use variance, which your ordinance even, does not even allow use variances anymore. Uh, so, so there's a major concern there. And so it's not just that one user, uh, but if, uh, go back here to this again. This, so we're talking about the comp plan and, and some of the comp plan policies, but there, there's more that the city has said in the comp plan about uh, uh, these types of uses. There's, uh, in the comp plan, there's a line that when it's talking about the employment center, this says the city must be proactive in extending essential services to these districts to support and attract high quality employers. The essential services that were noted in that, in the comp plan that need, the city should take a proactive hand in were, were not only the roads, but sewer, water, and fiber optic. This property has been left to Mr. Brown to develop sewer, water, road, all of those things the comp plan said that the city could should take a proactive hand in at an employment center to attract that high quality employer, the higher employer has not happened, is not going to happen, and it's being left to Mr. Brown to do it. And that's tough to do. And, it, and the city regulations make it particularly tough to do. And it, and uh, I would submit this is going to fall into one of those um, unintended consequences areas. The city ordinance uh, requires that upon subdivision of the property, and, the, and Eric talked about this briefly at the prior meetings, but upon subdivision of this property, it's an 87 acre single parcel now. So even that Duke proposal of multiple three and four acre parcels for development, but upon the first subdivision, the road has to be built. Not just, not just shown, not just an easement granted, the road has to be built. The estimate of, that was given uh, back when we started this petition at current prices, which actually recently have gone up again is cost of building materials. And I'm sure your uh, public works department's probably complained about the same problem, but the cost of construction of anything just is going through the roof right now. But uh, a couple of months ago, the esti engineer estimate for this road is $2.6 million. You cannot sell, subdivide this and carve off a three or four acre piece for the first developer to come in. I don't care if he's gonna employ 20 people or 50 people and put in a 2.6 or $2.7 million road. It just cannot be done. And that and that's the dilemma that's confronting Mr. Mr. Brown and trying to do anything in this property. Pre-pandemic, uh, we were not seeing people being come to this community and most communities were having the same issue. The, the large employer of 150, 200 people they're just, they're just not out there looking around. But I can tell you, those that are, are looking for shovel-ready ground. This is not shovel-ready ground. This road has to have a, this property has to have a road built, has to have the sewer extended up the line, has to have the water extended up the line. This is not shovel-ready. And we're, if we're a community competing with anybody else trying to lure that big manufacturing developer employer to the area. It's not going to happen out of private money. We have to put a $2.7 million road in before we can get anybody to even come and look at the property, let alone get serious about developing it. So, so why does this lead back to the MC? Uh, the MC zone provides some flexibility that is not available in the ME. It's not available in the current PUD. The MC zone allows some additional uses. Uh, it allows some additional retail uses, allows some additional commercial uses, and that's a significant component. Not only such things as the restaurant uh, for the employee amenities as, as maybe an issue with the potential 
development on the training center, but just in terms of spurring activity and generating money to put the road in. It's a, it's a simple fact that uh, commercially zoned ground or ground being sold for commercial purposes will generate a much better purchase price. It's going to take some significant development, even on commercial and retail uses at a higher price that's going to be able to generate the money to justify and the ability to even to put in a, a road at $2.6 million and more by the time it ever, we get around to it. And that's the road. And then we got the other issues of extending sewer lines, sewer and waters down in, uh, in uh, Fulton area, but it has to be run up and, and extended in throughout the property. So uh, the commercial uses and the retail uses that are available in the MC zone that are not available in the ME, have never been available in the PUD, are game changers. They're what is going to be, allow this property to be developed. There's what's going to be allow this property to be developed on private money, Mr. Brown's money, uh, to be able to fund those infrastructure needs. The, the TIF is, is not available to do it. So it is, it is private money only. <clears throat> so when you look at this, I would encourage you to, to pay attention to the comp plan. I don't think that this is, we're at odds with the comp plan. It does talk about uh, commercial or uh, industrial users and, uh, and manufacturing type users, but it even recognizes in the comp plan uh, commercial centers uh, as, as uh, some of this. It recognizes the need for retail as called an accessory use. Some of the retail we submit will come out there would be accessory to other uses, but some of it would be standalone. A full service restaurant, a sit down restaurant, it would be a standalone. It's not gonna be an accessory to another building or another use. But those are the uses that are gonna allow the property be developed. It's been 35 years and I keep saying that and that, uh, because it's important. Mr. Brown, uh, Eric made mention and referenced there'd been various proposals to do various things. There have been repeated efforts to find a way to get this property marketed and developed, and they just have not panned out. And there are lots of reasons. The PUD amendment uh, a number of years ago that allowed for the extended care facility, that, uh, that facility to go in, then there were a, it became a financing issue, but there are significant problems with the cost for the infrastructure that, that facility would have to put in to be able to develop there. And it became a financial impossibility. So despite the PUD amendment to allow the, the care facility, it didn't happen. The, the ME zone allows a hotel, but as a conditional use. Read the two and a half pages in the UDO of conditional use procedures that the hotel would have to jump through and the additional approval processes would suggest that there's no guarantee the hotel would be allowed in the ME zone despite it being listed as a, in the, at this site, despite the, uh, the uh, table use is calling it a conditional use. Uh, the MC zone is requested because, for two primary reasons, and then I'll, I'll move on. The first one is doing due consideration for what is the potential development of the site. That the restaurant is a, is a requirement. It, it, is, it is an essential component of the site for that user to come, to come here if we can get that done. No, no guarantees, but it is very promising and there have been too many conversations not to believe that it's a serious uh, in, uh, possibility. Beyond that one is the flexibility of the commercial and retail uses allowed in the MC zone would, uh, would be the basis by which this property is going to develop at all. If we have to put a two, uh, that expensive road in and run the infrastructure in up on the very first subdivision, the first carve out of any development on this, that is not gonna happen unless it's a huge development, which is not in the forecast, or have to juggle balls and get three or four or five small ones lined up all ready to go at the same time so that we it can generate the, the money available to put the road in. And that's just not likely to happen. It, I, this land should not be relegated to dormancy for another 35 years. The ME change zone changes nothing. The MC zone, zone is a game changer and it would be the, the impetus to allow this to, to finally get developed and it should develop. I know there's, there have been some concerns expressed whether this is sprawl or not. I, I personally look at it as an infill. I, Eric emphasized this being on the edge. This is on the edge today, but tell me four, four months from now, five months from now, if you haven't taken the, the corporate lines and bumped it out several hundred acres or thousand acres out and moved it, moved it out a half a mile or a mile to the west, and this is no longer on the edge, this is getting more to, into the middle of the corporate limits, or, or if I'm, I'm misreading the tea leaves on your annexation plans, but if, if I'm not, 
then this is not on the edge. If it is on the edge, it's, it's on a short, it's on a temporary basis. So, would it, uh, and on behalf of Mr. Brown, we would ask that your uh, consideration for rezoning this to mixed use quarter. It allows all the ME uses, the vast majority of them, it adds some additional uses for the flexibility that is it's going to be essential to be able to spur the development to see anything happen here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. Can you clear the screen? Yeah. Thank you for that presentation. Um, any other comments from Mr. Gerlich? I don't think so. We went to the petitioner. Um, do we have any questions from the council? Councilmember Scambellari. Yes, thank you. Um, I believe Mr. Crowley is on the call. Um, we've talked a lot about this being mixed use employment. And so I would be interested in his take from an economic development perspective. Hi everyone, Alex Crowley, Director of Economic Sustainable Development. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, so thanks for the question. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's always a little tough because uh, obviously we are in a weird moment right now. We're trying to figure out what the future looks like. Um, and, you know, it's a little unclear. So I think that certainly, um, you know, a, a question like this is worth asking on a parcel of land like this. I guess what I would say is a couple different things. I would say from a, you know, from a general economic development perspective, um, our community has to do everything it possibly can to set ourselves up to diversify our employment base gradually and increasingly away from our dependence on tourism. Uh, I mean, it is a, you know, it's a, it's a nice uh, base of, of revenue. It's a, it's a good employment base, but it is really a challenging uh, long-term play for us if we cannot grow the non-tourism employment base. So, you know, I think the, the, at the core of this question, and I appreciate Mr. Carmen um, and, and, and Mr. Brown's, you know, uh, community mindedness. I think they, they've proven that over time. So, uh, you know, I think they're, they're, trying to think through this as well. Um, but I, I think where I would come down on this myself is really in support of, of, of planning's decision because I think you know, we, we do have to look very carefully at somewhat limited land opportunities that exist right now and probably you know, for the next decade and think about you know, what is it that we can do as a city to try to maximize uh, the potential for the outcome of those to really drive to that non-tourism employment base. You know, I think the training opportunity, while it's out there, is, is really theoretical at this point. So I'm not sure that that in itself should warrant um, a, a decision. Um, you know, if you look at how Cook and more recently Catalan have become real game changers for our community, that's the kind of outcome that I think we have to keep stimulating and keep pursuing. Um, and I, I, I guess I would also, you know, respectfully suggest uh, that while I understand that 37 has been certainly a, 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 you know, a through road for the community, I would say that, that the advent of I-69, the connectivity that that creates between us and Crane you know, so, so so opening up uh, flexibility to the south and 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 really through traffic to the south, in a way that we're, wasn't as robust previously, um, but I do think that I sixty nine um, is a, is a pretty important development for Bloomington and and especially as it gets connected to the north. We you know we know that there's been a lot of focus on uh, ensuring that the interchanges on I sixty nine. Um, are curated uh, to really reflect our community and the possibilities that they represent for our community. So, you know, it would be a little bit sad to see, uh, you know, a bunch of generic, I mean, you know, I'm sure everybody's driven across Route 70 or wherever, and, you know, you, you pretty much every interchange it sort of looks like another interchange. And, it, and, and I'm not sure that that really reflects what we're 
what we're interested in as a community to, to, to have on our interchanges off 69. So this, you know, the, the proximity that this represents to one of those interchanges becomes uh, all the more important. So, you know, I think what I would say is, um, again, the, you know, diversification is, is, is really, really important for Bloomington for the next 10 and 20 years. The comp plan, uh, while I understand that it's, it's you know, aspirational, um, at some level is, you know, is the comp plan. And, and I kind of feel like we should stick to that plan to the extent that we can. Um, and so, you know, the MC designation certainly would accelerate, you know, or, or potentially would accelerate development. I worry that um, development for its own sake is, is different than um, development that we uh, absolutely would want to see. And I worry that the MC designation would, uh, w once you start allowing things under that, uh, it, you know, th then it's sort of game over for the, for the, for the lot. I, I'm not sure that you can pull back from that. So, so I would suggest we, you know, follow the planning's recommendation and, um, you know, and, and, and let, let time play out a little bit with, with the advent of, of I-69 and see if we can make this um, parcel work as hard as possible for Bloomington. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Council Member Rallo. Uh, Mr. Gerlich, uh, is this, I'm, I'm trying to remember if the, this TIF district, this is uh, a loan out there, right? This wasn't part of the consolidation of TIF districts, right? Uh, no, to our knowledge, this was part of the consolidated TIF. So this oh, is it part is. of the overall area. Yeah. This is all part of the overall area. Um, okay. So because I'm wondering about, um, you know, a future road there, which would be Weimar Road extension, correct? Is the, uh, uh, the, the petitioner, Mr. Carmen, talked about a $2.6 million road that would be essentially be required to extend Weimar to Fullerton? Is that, yes, is that's that, correct. This, is this that your would be understanding? The of Weimer. Okay. And um, so uh, obviously those, uh, is it your understanding? What, 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 is, what is the general feeling about applying TIF funds for that infrastructure? I mean, we have a lot of competing interests within the TIF, right? Is well, there, certainly, there... I mean, certainly that's a that's a question for the council to address uh, within themselves. You know, if they feel like it is an appropriate uh, designation or appropriation of TIF funds to fund the development within that. Well, I, maybe that it is getting the cart before the horse. But what is the planning department's uh, feeling about uh, by pursuing an employment center as a, as opposed to a mixed use corridor? Uh, would we be applying? to funds to, to extend that road? Would that be your recommendation or, or do you know? Well, so, you know, I mean, neither, neither one of those zoning districts themselves would require TIF funds. Um, is that kind of what you're asking? Well, I guess what I'm getting at is um, facilitating an employment center as opposed to mixed use corridor. Um, and since we've, you, you stated that the employment center is the better use. It's what the comprehensive plan points to. And um, so I'm, I'm wondering about how we achieve that uh, in, in a way that, uh, that doesn't leave this sort of an orphaned area in terms of, uh, you know, pursuing that employment center. Well, um, so but, certainly, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I had a secondary question, but go ahead if you have a response. I mean, I guess certainly you know, I, I was going to say that you have to weigh what is what is the, the benefit for using public funds to, pro, to fund private sure. development for that TIF. Uh, you know, mixed use employment and the employment center is supposed to uh, draw in larger employment generating uses, which would ideally employ a, a great deal of the community base. Um, so that could, you know, have a lot better impacts. Uh, you know, you look at some of the uses in the MC zoning district, while some of them, you know, might be somewhat in, uh, high employment, you're not going to get 
uh, you know, a large scale employer, you know, with a, a Wendy's or a, you know, a restaurant or a vehicle repair, you know, those are not really providing an overall benefit to the community that may not justify, you know, the use of private or public funds to fund private development. Um, does that kind of get to that a little bit better? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry about the ambigu ambiguity of that. Um, but this is a little more specific question. I wondered about, you referred to, and we know that there are a limited number of interchanges along I-69, Fullerton Pike being one of them. And Mr. Carmen was actually highlighting an area that I thought was pertinent. And that was maybe to your uh, primary point at the beginning, which is that land uses are to be balanced so that they, they don't cannibalize one another in terms of you know th their competition. And is that your contention here that this, because an employment center is, it, it, this points to an employment center precisely because of all of the retail uses that are at various interchanges already existing. Is that is that true? Well, you know, certainly you've got a, a large aggregation of those. And I would say that, you know, that's a great example of when you zone for that, those are the types of uses that you get there. Um, you know, the, that's what kind of happens in those areas. You know, you get the large retail, the restaurants, um, you know, so because those uses haven't been allowed at this site, you know, that's, that's why you're not getting those at this location and mm -hmm. that, you know, you're selecting for uh, the different uses that we want to see here, the, the larger employment generating uses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Any further questions from council? Okay. Seeing none, um, uh, Ms. Lacey, I'm sorry, Council Member Smith. I just had one for Mr. Gerlich. Um, given the fact that the parcel's been there for a long time and nothing's really happened, um, what factors do you think um, may spur somebody uh, that might take advantage of the, you know, the employment center. Well, so, you know, to, to kind of answer that, I guess, um, you know, that's where TIF funds could be something or, you know, tax abatement to some degree, you know, those are tools that the council has at their disposal if they want to, you know, kind of go above and beyond. Um, you know, one of, one of our concerns or, or, you know, positions has been, you know, using this and keeping this zoned as employment will ensure that this happens and that those uses come in that we want to see. You know, there's, there are, there's tons of land within the community zone for uh, commercial uses, the MC zoning district. And, you know, what I was trying to illustrate with the slide of the comprehensive plan and where the employment centers are in that zoning district, it's very limited. Um, you know, so there, there's not really a short of commercial uses that we feel is necessary within the community um, for the long term growth of the city. Um, you know, we want employment uses and, you know, one of the things that we certainly recognize is that you need to have restaurant uses and maybe some other retail uses to help fill in some of the gaps. Um, we've proposed an amendment to the mixed use employment district to try to open that up just a little bit to allow restaurants up to 5000 square feet to allow for medium scale retail, uh, to try to fill in those gaps a little bit. But overall, you know, we want to try to keep the use list minimized to uh, keep out some of those uses that would kind of feed away or take away from the land that's available for uh, those bigger uses that we want to see here. Or that's necessary for the long term, you know, growth of, of the city. And that's what we're looking at, you know, we want to be aware of. And that's one of the things I've designated here is that this is a unique site. It's a large piece of ground adjacent to I-69. Um, you know, we need to have land that's for employment uses for the long term, 20 or 40, 60, 80, 100 year uh, needs of the community. Uh, and, may I ask oh, a follow up would be, are there other um, parcels of land along 69 um, near there that could be um, used for, um, you know, manufacturer would come in and say, oh, I love Bloomington. I want that one that we're looking at right now. Are there other 
options? No, no, there are not really other vacant areas of, of the corridor along I-69 um, that would have a zoning that would allow for offices uh, that aren't already encumbered with uses. You know, you look at the area around 3rd Street and 2nd Street, um, you know, there are not any undeveloped parcels in there. Certainly there's some area along 3rd Street, uh, perhaps in Whitehall Plaza. Uh, or other areas where, you know, you could further infill, but there are existing uses that are there. There are not any real, there are not any vacant tracts of land along I-69 besides this area here um, and a little bit of area to the east of Southern Indiana uh, Physicians along Tap Road. Uh, but this is, this is the only real vacant land we've got along I-69. Thank you. And then may I ask Mr. Carmen one? If you don't mind, let's wait for the second round. Let's see, if, do we have any other council Thank members you. have any questions? Okay, Council Member Smith, looks like we got there quick, fast, and in a hurry. So well, that go was, right ahead. Well, that was. Um, Thank you, Mr. Carmen, for the presentation. And uh, I think what I want to ask is, uh, I I believe I understand that if it went to the scenario that it's an employment center, that does that mean that Mr. Brown would have sold property to a manufacturer? You broke up, auto broke up there. I didn't oh, catch your so, question, I'm sorry. Sorry, it, if it would, would if a, an, uh, a manufacturer came in the area and wanted to buy that, um, uh, wanted to develop that, that would mean that Mr. Brown would sell that to the manufacturer, correct? Yes, right. He's, he's not the builder. No, he, it would be a, a, a sale with the build by the buyer. Yes. Okay. And can I ask this question? How much is the parcel worth to a manufacturer? I, I, I couldn't tell you. Okay. Okay. But I, I, I couldn't tell you on that in terms of relative terms. I do know, and, and we've seen demonstrated time and time again in other developments that commercial retail land for those uses sell at a lot better price than, than other uses, which is why the, the argument for the MC flexibility, but uh, what the specific dollars are, I, I'd be just guessing. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Carmen, and thank you, President Sims. You're quite welcome. Seeing no other comments, oh, I'm sorry, questions from council, we'll now go to the public. Um, Ms. So, Lacey, do we have anything that you see? Well, members of the public who would like to speak on ordinance um, 2108 can use the raised hand function in Zoom or they can send a message to the meeting host. And I don't presently see any hands raised and there are no messages. Okay, give it just a second. And seeing none, we'll return to council for a final comments if we have any. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. If I could just speak on behalf of the plan commission, this was an interesting conversation when this was first pitched to us. And uh, the six to one vote um, was a bit controversial because I know the planning staff does not like us to send something to this body with no recommendation. They would prefer that we either send it with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. But I will say that one of the reasons why it became an interesting kind of a, you know, reasonable doubt put in our minds was there was, uh, there were representatives from the BEDC at that time. And I do not see them in the meeting here tonight. And so I don't know if that means that they've pulled their, their, um, their concerns or their interests, but I'm sure that uh, Mr. Crowley works very closely with Jen and the BEDC. I know uh, my time when I was the liaison for the BEDC, and I, this was a while ago when Ron Walker was still the director, I know one of the things that they talked about that it's hard to recruit major employers to this community. And a lot of times these major players were very competitive for them. 
And one of the things that they look for is shovel ready opportunities to come in. And so I think the conversation about the TIF districts and that road uh, would be beneficial to Alex Crowley and the Economic Development uh, Department, as well as the BEDC, in attracting the kind of major employers, the uh, corporate headquarters and the light industrial and the various employment centers that are going to provide good jobs with good salaries. And I completely agree that we do not want to encourage a bunch of service industry jobs. That's not the way we're going to improve Bloomington. Um, and, and so th this was a hard decision, again, for the plan commission to struggle with, because when we were asking the reps from the BEDC, did they have any kind of projection about what they're looking at with respect to recruiting major employers to the community? And they indicated that they might be in the middle of doing some studies to kind of take a look at the economic market out there and, and see what the appetite was going to be for a major employment center. And that study was inconclusive. And so, again, they didn't really give us anything uh, to hang our hats on, but they gave us enough to, to have reasonable doubt about, is this the right way to go to keep this open for the ME when um, what's on the horizon with respect to the pandemic and the economic downturn and everything else that we're looking at with respect to the economic environment. And so that just gives you just a little background as to where we were at that time with the plan commission and why we sent it to you you all for a more robust discussion about this. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from council members? Council member Smith. Well, I'm pretty persuaded that this is a good idea. Um, pretty much based on, I just can't see that the momentum for and then, you know, an industry to come in to Bloomington and buy over there. They haven't done it in 35 years. It doesn't seem like uh, there's any um, any bites uh, in the water. So I pretty I favor this idea, and and I think uh, Mr. Brown and Mr. Carmen will uh, keep an eye on it for Bloomington, and and uh, there will be some jobs created there. Uh, perhaps there'll be some light industrial, who knows? Um, so that's about all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any other final comments? Seeing none, are we ready for the council member P. Ma Smith? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I uh, wanted to... Um, well, uh, I want to say two things. There are two reasons why I'm opposed to this. The first is that um, it does go against what's in our comprehensive plan. And the second is uh, kind of questioning the whole paradigm of, of development uh, on the edges of our urban area. Um, I just think that, that any development here is, uh, is is sprawl basically. I mean, it is on the the very very southern part of of our city, and far away from uh, where people live. And uh, it'll definitely be a car dependent development, whatever ends up there. So I'm not inclined to make it easier for anybody to develop that land. And you know, with all due respect to Mr. Brown, who, who is a longstanding member of the community and has, has invested a lot in the community. This, I'm just not inclined to, to help something develop there. I think that this is, you know, investment dollars are better spent on development that is um, not so auto dependent. So I wanted to add that to uh, the reasoning this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any further final comments from council? Okay, council member Rollo. Uh, I agree with council member Piedmont Smith and I would rather continue adhering to the comprehensive plan and be judicious about uh, what locates here. Uh, I, I don't think that we need uh, more small scale um, retail in this area uh, just simply for the sake of it. I think that uh, Councilmember Sandberg 
made an excellent point in that regard. Um, so I, uh, I, I'll support planning and um, ESD and, and their judgment uh, to maintain the, uh, uh, the ME. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Carmen, do you have a hand up? I think we're in council final comments, so I'm not so. You do have your hand up? If, if I'm allowed to speak, yes. Well, I will recognize it, but it please be brief. Okay. Uh, I will. Very, uh, well, very okay. brief. All right. Uh, I'm a speed talker. I'll get to it. Uh, uh, Mr. Rollo made a comment on a prior petition about he does not want to necessarily see PEDs get lost because that's a negotiation opportunity that you don't get in the straight zones. And, and I agree with that. And this is one of those cases. What you're relegated to now with giving away PEDs is the what you would call reasonable conditions of approval. Uh, it's in the packet as a condition concerning the commitment concerning the use and development of real estate. The law allows it to be done. That becomes the negotiation. After the first plan commission meeting, it was certainly suggested uh, by a couple of members, and we remember Brad uh, specifically about maybe we need to have some negotiation, petitioner and planning to, about the uses that would be allowed out there. It didn't happen. We proposed a list of excluded uses. That's what Eric showed you early on his. Uh, and I got essentially nothing back from planning. They're, they're focused on, they want the ME and they're not gonna essentially talk about anything else. That's what it came down to. When I finally got a response from Eric, it was basically, well, there's not much I can say because what we don't want is what you do want. So it doesn't give us much to talk about. And that was the extent of the negotiation. And, and, and that's the problem because what you're doing, <laughs> Well, it is a problem because that's the only way you're going to deal with the concerns about miscellaneous small retail and things coming in there is they could be excluded by that statement of commitment. And you could do that. Uh, we've offered some. If you think there are others that should be excluded, that that could be done uh, as a condition, reasonable condition of approval. Uh, because if you look at a lot of the ME uses that you're saying are allowed, things you're saying you don't want there, the ME is going to allow some of that. They're they're permitted uses with ME. They're coming anyway, but that's not what we're promoting. That's not what we're trying to do. That's not what we're promoting, but that's the fact of the ME zoning. And, and so to wrap this up, and I, I just, I do think there has to be an element of fairness in what we're doing with this property. Mr. Brown's 87 acres, a, a big chunk of it has been dedicated to public, to the public good. That's the Cars Conservancy area. And you may want to say, well, that's just too bad. Your property has cars features on it. And when he bought that property, a cars conservative area wasn't even a twinkle in anybody's eye, but it's done. And, that, and that's something to live with. Now, and I complained before to somebody before, and they, I was challenged on what I was talking about, about your tying Mr. Brown's hands. He's being told now, the TIF's not, I have no expectation the TIF's going to put the road in. It's not going to extend that. You've had years to do that, and it's not going to happen. The money's going elsewhere. And he's being told, you cannot develop this unless you put the road in, because we can't carve off anything. And so you're, you're saying land bank it, and that's not fair. It's not right, and frankly, I think it's illegal. It's called a taking. When, you're, when you regulate in a manner intentionally to prevent it from being used, that's a taking, and that's wrong too. And I would submit that the MC zone is appropriate. It is not in conflict with the comp plan. I would ask you to, to approve it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. Do we have any other final comments? Okay, let's see. Council Member Volan. Uh, yes, first, I have a brief question for Councilor Sandberg. Councilor Sandberg, did you say what your personal vote was on the plan commission? Were you an abstainer or a, uh, I, I, I don't recall what your vote was. On sending it to council with yeah. no recommendation? Yeah. I, was, I was in the majority. I was one of the six. I see. Yeah. Um, I share Councilor Sandberg's ambivalence, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think that uh, my colleagues have made some, also made some good points. I do question Councilor Piedmont Smith's uh, assertion that uh, uh, she she has said it. She said it in committee too that this is sprawl, and I've I've thought about that phrase for a bit, and I I think, uh, well, we if we don't like sprawl, we have the ability to uh, prevent it or do something different. Um, you know, in theory, this doesn't have to be sprawl if the area around it. I mean, we're looking at annexing. Uh, neighborhoods uh, w directly west of the highway that are, you know, why would be, we be an accident if, unless they've been urbanized? Uh, granted, they may be suburbanized, but they're still developed. So um, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand that argument, but 
Um, the question I think for me has been, um, will this road or any development out here somehow be less suburban, less sprawling than uh, it would be otherwise if we make this change? And uh, I must admit, I don't know that I have enough information even now to make that decision. I was the abstainer in committee. Um, and uh, like, I just, uh, I'm not that I particularly want to hold this. Uh, I just, even now, I don't know what the right answer is. I'm not entirely persuaded by Mr. Carmen's arguments and I'm not entirely persuaded by uh, 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 the planning's arguments. Uh, I. I'm sort of eager to hear what other people have to say. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that's where the abstain rule comes in. Council Member Flaherty. Sure. Um, yeah, I plan to oppose um, passing this ordinance uh, as I did in committee. Um, I think the comprehensive plan certainly can point to some things that um, suggest flexibility or transformation and kind of and try to craft an argument. But I mean, the future land use map in Exhibit Nine is is very very clear. Uh, that this area should be uh, reserved for uh, ME and employment. We heard that from Mr. Crowley and uh, Mr. Grulick as well. And that, I mean, that's, th the city is legally allowed to zone, zone certain areas of the city in it to encourage the type of development and land use uh, that we would like to see. Uh, I, I really don't think that's a taking um, of any kind. And, you know, regarding um, the construction of infrastructure, I mean, uh, that's that's what very very large parcels gets you. I mean, we're not we're not obligated to build that. Speculating that if we do, uh, it might attract the right type of development that we will see a return. Uh, you know, that will pay for an increment in, in tax revenue that will pay for the infrastructure cost. Uh, I said this in committee. Mr. Brown can make the same type of speculation and build the infrastructure with the assumption that we will develop and he will make money. Um, but. Uh, I just, I just don't think, in particular, on sort of a far edge of town like this that lacks connectivity, um, it, it's not really uh, our job to be to ensure that this develops as quickly or as soon as possible. If it takes another decade or two, uh, you know, that's that's just the nature of of uh, the market and uh, you know the risks that come with purchasing large tracts of lands and sort of speculating about future use. I think everything the city has advocated for is entirely within its, uh, you know, rights and in line with the comprehensive plan. So I just um, don't, have not heard any compelling evidence to, or reasons in my mind to to go against staff's recommendation on this. Uh, so I'll be voting no. Okay, thank you all for those comments. Um, seeing no further comments, are we ready for the question? Okay, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Smith? Yes. Sandberg? No. Rallo? No. Volen? Abstain. Rosenbarger? No. Scambalori? No. Sims? No. Flaherty? No. Piedmont Smith? No. Thank you. Thank you. And that fails 171. I do believe I've got that correct. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on into the agenda. We do have first readings or legislation for first readings. Council Mayor Flaherty. Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2111 um, be introduced and read by the clerk by a title and synopsis only. Second. It has been moved and seconded that ordinance. Sorry about that, Eli. 2111. Um, be introduced read by the clerk by title and synopsis on the will the clerk please read. Should, uh, would you like me to call the roll on that first? Yes, please. Thank okay. you. I would, member. Not, not only would I like it, I would love it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Council member Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. 
Bullen? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Scambleri? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. And S Smith? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Will the clerk please read? Yes, Ordinance 2111 to amend Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Administration and Personnel regarding updating and harmonizing portions of Title II of the Municipal Code. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2111 makes several changes to Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code to bring the title into line with change statutes to clarify references and to harmonize current practices and the city code. Thank you. We have other legislation for first reading. Yes, sir. Council Member Flaherty. Um, uh, point of order, um, President, Mr. President, I think yes. um, we could consider a motion uh, for referral to a committee uh, if it's uh, the will of the council. Um, I'm, I'm also actually going to ask uh, for one of our council attorneys to weigh in if it's okay with you. Um, in relation to the 1030 rule and what constitutes um, council action for that purpose, um, whether um, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just not sure offhand how we've defined that or if, if we have a, uh, yeah, I'm unprepared to, to answer that. Um, I am fine with that um, as far as introductions, but I'm not so sure first readings are considered that, but. Mr. Lucas right. or Ms. Lacey. Well, council member Volan had his hand raised. I don't know if he's got uh, some, something to add on how the council has interpreted this in the past. Um, I'll say that 1030 rule calls for a two thirds uh, vote of the council to take uh, action uh, past 1030. So um, given that th this is first reading for the three items, I, I suspect there won't be a problem with, with having two thirds of the council support that, but um, uh, was there another question you had, Councilmember Flaherty? Just, uh, I guess, a point of information on that on that um, interpretation. So, any any referral to committee, introduction by first reading, et cetera, would all require two thirds majority at this point. Is that? I see you're asking beyond um, uh, any vote we take, basically. <laughs> uh, um, that's a good question. I don't know that we've thought about that. Um, well, it, it seems like it would take two votes um, using this scenario, <clears throat> one to extend the meeting on that ordinance and then the other as a majority vote. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And while we think about that, Councilmember Bolden. Yes, um, the I'm pulling up city code again here, but traditionally we've used this to prevent the second readings from continuing. Um, but uh, in this case, the issue is um, no legislation may be introduced for council action after 10.30 p.m. without a two-thirds vote. So the introduction requires two-thirds, but referral of it to something does not. And in any case, uh, because we're, uh, thanks to Zoom and the pandemic, we're having an obligation to vote on every introduction, there's no need to invoke it. Uh, if, uh, if for some reason an introduction is only 5-4, that would fail. I don't think we've ever seen that, so. It, it, it's fine. We can we can proceed Second. as we have. Okay. Are you? Is, I would I would agree with Councilmember Bolin. Yes. Okay. And our parliamentarians on board with that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and before we move to the second um, ordinance in this reading, um, I as president would like to refer this to the committee of the whole. I also understand that the land use committee next meeting has been moved to the 24th. And I would further propose that the land use committee meeting uh, commence from 5.30 to 7 p.m. And that the committee of the whole would start at, I wanna say seven, but 7.10 p.m. sounds a little more appropriate. So, um, Councilmember Flaherty, our parliamentarian, where were we when you asked the question? I'm sorry. 
That's okay. I and this is kind of new for all of us uh, with, oh, with the no, that's Oh, that's fine. I'm just trying to figure out where <laughs> yeah. were we on this place. No, that's um, right. I'm oh, sorry. I can. Um, I just wanted to note that uh, per our recent Title II update in in um, uh, via, via ordinance, uh, the the president has the right to make a preliminary referral um, to committee, which is what I think I believe you just invoked. Uh, although um, it would be proper for, for uh, any member to to uh, move uh, to the contrary if they so wish, um, but. Uh, and, 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 and also I'll just note uh, with regard to scheduling times, we no longer need to include a time uh, for a meeting when referring to committee of any kind. And the president is uh, authorized to uh, set those agendas, including the time uh, going forward. I know that's a, a change as well. So I just wanted to note those two uh, procedural matters. Well, thank you. And I think when we discussed that title, um, that was made clear. And the land use committee being separate from the committee of the whole, I think would require a time. Am I incorrect? No, you're correct in that. I didn't mean to suggest that times won't be needed, simply that uh, it, you know members making a motion shouldn't feel on any committee referral, um, other members as well shouldn't feel the need to uh, include a time. I think it's okay to, and certainly in your, in your role, uh, since you'll be the one uh, setting that. Does that. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> well, it does, but I think, um, uh, uh, if there was a motion to do something else, then that would come with the time because it could go to variable committees. And that's something I think we could discuss um, moving forward. Council Member Volan. Yes, I'd actually like to make a motion to not send Ordinance 2111 to committee at all. Um, hmm, sorry, uh, it, Mr. President. Yes. <laughs> yes. I might yes. ask for additional uh, guidance from, from our council attorneys. My, my impression uh, is that a, a, a failure to send a committee uh, or com either a standing committee or committee of the whole um, by vote would, would default to send it to second reading, which is what we did with ordinances 2109 and 10 uh, tonight. But I'm uh, not sure. I'm, I'm debating the, the, uh, the appropriateness of a, of a motion to send straight to second reading without a committee referral. Well, that's what we did, and I recommend that it goes to the committee of the whole. I, I understand your consternation here, but I think if his motion does not get a second, it's a moot point. I need a second. So, no, you 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 want a second? I second. Okay, been properly moved and second. Uh, could could um sorry. Now, I now we debate on this. <laughs> Councilmember Flaherty, I, I got your point, but it needed a second to continue, I thought. Sure, no, you're correct, and I appreciate that. So again, as a, as a point of order, um, uh, wondering if, if we have additional guidance from council staff on the appropriateness of a motion uh, to not refer to committee uh, in order to send it to second reading. Yes, I, I think I can win. Um, we have a code provision that says the council can agree by majority vote to discharge any committee from uh, further consideration of any matter referred to it. Um, I know this matter was referred seconds ago and the committee hasn't considered it at all, but I, I think a majority vote of the council could um, could decide what happens with legislation, or, you know, where it's referred or where it's not referred, if it's referred at all. Okay. Is it proper to now, based on this motion, to ask the clerk to call the roll? Um, Yes, Council Member Baldwin. Well, I thought we, I'd like to be able to explain my motion. Is it debatable, Mr. Lucas? I believe so, yes. Uh, very briefly, while oh, I have literally just tonight stated my opposition to the Committee of the Whole, that's not what this motion is about. Uh, I happen to have spoken with uh, City Legal about this ordinance because I have many concerns about Title II. And uh, I am so not at all concerned about this ordinance. It's It's really innocuous changes that I think uh, the committee of the whole would dispose of very quickly. And like, uh, you know, other, uh, like, like with, I mean, we, the uh, utilities ordinances we considered tonight were much more substantial than this ordinance. And so I just don't think we need to send it to committee. I think it's fine to go to second reading and that's okay. So that's, that's the spirit in which I'm offering this. I would say the same for the other two ordinances. I'll be moving, making the same motions tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. 
parliamentarian, where are we then? Is this uh, roll call? We're in debate, a debate on the motion. So uh, yes. if there's no if there's no other um, uh, comments, then yes, uh, uh, a vote would be appropriate. Any further comments? Okay. Will the clerk please call the roll on? Did you have you had a Councilmember Scambler raised your hand. I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Councilmember Scambler. Hi. Um, thank you. I have actually a couple questions on 2111 that I would like answered. Um, and committee, the whole is a fine setting for doing it. And I'd rather do it before we get to second reading. So I would just offer that thought. I'll be opposing this um, particular motion. So thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, seeing none, can will the clerk please call the roll on this motion? And if I need to repeat it, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Councilmember Bowling. This was to a motion to bypass any committee referral and go straight to second reading. As Mr. Lucas said it was to discharge a committee from considering it all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe I, I can weigh in. Um, I, I think a referral happened when the president announced uh, it, it the, did referring the item to committee of the whole. So I think this motion that you you'd need to make is a motion to discharge the committee from from considering the item. That's my motion. Thank you. Are, are you muted? Ooh. No, but my microphone was really far up on my head. There, my apologies. There you go. Uh, just for clarification, song. when Councilmember Volan made his motion, he said it was to not refer Ordinance 21 to a committee reading. Is that what you all It's a understand? motion to discharge it from a uh, referral to a committee. Motion to discharge. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so Councilmember Rallo. No. Councilmember Volin. Yes. Councilmember Rosenbarger. Yes. Councilmember Scambellari. No. Councilmember Sims. No. Councilmember Flaherty. No. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. No. Councilmember Smith. No. And Councilmember Sandberg. No. Thank you. Thank you for that. That motion fails 2-7. It will be referred to committee of a whole um, as originally suggested. Um, we have more first readings. As a member of Flaherty. Yes, Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 2112 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and second. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? She's still with hey. us there. She is. Thank you. I am just catching up. Councilmember Volan? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambellari? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rallo? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you, and that motion carries. Nine zero. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance twenty one twelve to amend Title fifteen of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Vehicles and Traffic regarding restricted turns on red at signalized intersections. The synopsis is as follows: This ordinance amends Title fifteen of the Bloomington Municipal Code. 
The changes include adding several new signalized intersections to and correcting a number of existing signalized intersections on the table of locations with restricted turns on red. Thank you. Um, as president, I also uh, would like to refer that to Committee of the Whole as well. And we will enter. Are there any other motions um, in that regard? Mm -hmm. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Um, I move to send this to the Transportation Committee. Second. It's been moved and second, sent to the Transportation Committee. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Uh, point of, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Get, it's getting late. I've not been here for a couple of weeks. Thank you. This is debatable, and we do have comments and questions and debate. Council Member Rosenbarger. Thank you. Uh, the three co-sponsors are all on the transportation committee, so I would. Um, Rather it go to either committee of the whole or on to second reading. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You would rather go to the committee of the whole or second reading? Yes, yes. I think um, right. because you know, three out of the four people on transportation co-sponsored it, um, it it makes more sense for the whole group to hear it next time. Okay. Um Who's okay? I'm I'm with you. Um, Councilmember P. Ma Smith made the motions. Councilmember Volan seconded. Gotcha. Any other um, debate, Councilmember Volan? I was just going to say because my motion to discharge failed, uh, I saw no point in making that same motion this time. Uh, I agree with Councilmember Rosenbarger that going to transportation is not uh, ideal, but I uh, also think that uh, this one doesn't even need to go to committee either. But whatever, I, I disagree again with the liberal use of committee of the whole. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yeah, um, I would like to withdraw my motion. I didn't realize that there were three co sponsors on this legislation that were all members of the Transportation Committee. Thank you, um, Councilmember Flaherty. Does the president's referral to committee the whole now stand? I, I believe it would. My, my only question is actually, um, can a properly moved and seconded motion that's being debated be withdrawn um, uh, by the sponsor? Uh, sorry that I don't know this offhand. I'll defer to Mr. Lucas. I, I think technically it's the council's motion at that point. Um, if, if the council wants to handle it by unanimous consent, if there's no objection to the withdrawal, I think that's that's a fine procedure. Um, if there is an objection, I think it takes a majority vote to withdraw it. Okay, um, I think there may be. So <laughs> do we have any objections to the sponsor of this motion um, pulling it off the board? Okay, thank you. Um, ordinance 21-12 um, referred to the Committee of the Whole. Council Member Flaherty, we have one more piece of first reading legislation. Yes, President Sims, I move Ordinance 2113 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Rosenbarger. Yes. Scambellari? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. And Volin? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that motion rules has been moved and seconded that ordinance 21-13 be introduced and read by the clerk entitled by and synopsis only. Will the clerk please read? 
Yes, Ordinance 2113 to amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Vehicles and Traffic regarding amending Chapters 1232080, Schedule M, No Parking Zones, to remove three no parking zones and add 10 no parking zones, and to amend Chapter 1532100, Schedule O, Loading Zones, to add two loading zones. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends Title 15, Vehicles and Traffic of the Bloomington Municipal Code and comes forth at the request of city staff and the Parking and Traffic Commissions. The ordinance makes the following changes. It deletes three no parking zones on 6th Street. It adds 10 no parking zones in the Renwick area and it adds two loading zones. Thank you very much and um... As can be anticipated, I would like to refer that to the Committee of the Whole as well. Again, Land Use Committee meeting next Wednesday of the 24th. I'm sorry, yeah, the 24th. We'll begin at 5.30 and last until 7 p.m. Um, as we're talking tonight, then the Committee of the Whole can commence at 7.10 p.m. Thank you. Moving on down the agenda. Do we have any additional public comment this evening? Um, this is allotted a maximum of 25 minutes has been set aside for this section. Um, please indicate um, your desire to make a public comment by using the raise hand function in Zoom or sending us the host a message in chat. Ms. Lacey, do you see anything? There are presently no hands raised and I don't have any messages in chat. Okay, thank you. We'll give it just a second. Just wanna make sure we're very respectful and collegial with our public. Thank you. Seeing none, um, we'll now address matters of council schedule. Um, is that you, Mr. Lucas, or are you, Ms. Lacey? I can, I can address that if you'd like. Um, the council has a work session scheduled for this Friday. Um, at the moment, I don't believe there are any uh, new items of legislation that would be ready to come forward during the next legislative cycle that would start April the 7th. Um, there may be uh, one item that, that will be ready. That's uh, a Title 18 repeal and replace, uh, but the council heard about that at a work session several weeks ago. Um, that item at the moment um, is being reviewed by the uh, state commission um, and uh, that won't be ready to come forward until the state commission has weighed in. So that's the only item that, that may be coming forward that cycle, a new item. Uh, so uh, given the lack of any new business for this Friday's work session, the council might want to uh, consider a motion to cancel that, uh, that work session this Friday. Mr. President, I move that we cancel the work session for Friday, um, March 18th. Second. Thank you, it's been probably moved in second. Uh, Councilmember Member Piedmont Smith. President, I believe that would be- It's March 19th. <laughs> I'm 19th, sorry. 19th, sorry, 19th, you're right. <laughs> Council. Oh, that was the correction, Councilmember Mayor Piedmont Smith, okay. For this Friday to cancel. Um, do we have any comments from colleagues? Okay, thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll? Sorry about that. Um, okay. Yes, Council Member Scambellari? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Volan? Yes. And Rosenberger? Yes. Thank you. Okay, and that um, passes 9-0. Work session for 319. is that the correct date? Yes, <laughs> has been canceled. Um, I do not believe there's any other business. Are there any other business available? Yes, 
Mr. Lucas. Just, just a few a few more reminders because this will be the last uh, regular session of March. Um, the fifth Wednesday in March, uh, March 31st, uh, there is no meeting scheduled uh, for that date. Um, I also want to uh, take the chance to, uh, in case any uh, folks uh, interested in the Jack Hopkins process are, are watching or will be watching, um, there's a technical assistance meeting that will be held tomorrow, uh, I believe at 4 p.m. Uh, for any applica uh, applicants uh, for, for that grant. Um, that'll be held over Zoom. The information is on the Jack Hopkins website. Um, I also want to uh, state that the deadline for applications for that process was moved from April the 2nd, which fell on uh, spring holiday, which is a city holiday, um, was moved from that Friday until April the 5th. So that gives uh, any applicants, if, if they're watching at 11 o'clock tonight, uh, a few more days and, and the opportunity to still drop off applications in person uh, since City Hall will be closed on April the 2nd. So uh, just with those few reminders, uh, that's all I've got tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no other business, do we have a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. Second. adjourn. Second. All right, it's been probably moved in second. Can we, um... oh, that's the clerk. Can we just say all oh, those in favor say aye? Aye. Is that is that proper? Okay. All those opposed? Thank you. I'll get a lecture from that from our previous parliamentarian tomorrow, but that's okay. It's been a good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.